Howdy y'all. Welcome back to Little Bits. There's our handsome man Valentino in the background. And in the foreground we have Specky. This is a little development computer that I use to do firmware testing. Um, I've showed off this little firmware card in the past for swapping out between an installed ROM and uh, a ROM that you can upload via the serial cable. And we're gonna be using this computer today to explore Collapse OS, a fourth language based operating system for 8-bit computers. Uh, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and set this up and show you how I use it to make changes to firmware and test those changes. And we'll talk a little bit about Collapse OS, how it works and how you can program with it. And Specky will be our star of the show today. Say, hi, Specky. Hi, Specky. Bye, Valentino. Bye, everybody. So to begin with, we're going to look at the Dusk OS repository and the Collapse OS repository by Virgil Dupra. He is the author of both Dusk OS and Collapse OS. Now the latest revision of Collapse OS is actually maintained from within and lives within Dusk OS. However, the various ports of Collapse OS for different systems have almost a wrapper layer of code around them that allow you to target certain platforms. So if we go look at these different code bases that Virgil has here, we can see here's the RC2014 port of Collapse OS and here's the Apple IIe port of Collapse OS. Here's the uh, uh, PC port of Collapse OS. Here's the TI-84 port of Collapse OS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for a while there, I believe this is the port that Virgil was doing all of his, um, the TRS-80 port, or the Coco 2 it might have been actually. One of these was the one that he was doing all of his Collapse OS development from for a little while. So because Collapse OS can build itself. So he was building it from within Collapse OS and, and making updates that way. Um, now it works very similar to that, except Dusk OS is actually responsible for building Collapse OS. Now, what you'll see is in order to allow that to work is that this port actually uses Dusk OS as a sub module. So when you, download this port, you're going to want to uh, do a git submodule update dash dash init to get the latest uh, branch of the latest uh, submodule of Dusk OS installed into there. And uh, we can look at the Dusk OS repository for the COS directory here. This is actually where Collapse OS is uh, main implementation lives, right? So this is pretty much the Collapse OS operating system. This is the entire code base for Collapse OS. It lives, as I said, within Dusk OS. But then what we have in here is configuration that is specific to the RC2014. So we have some code here that is for the Z80 based RC2014. Now, a lot of our small computer central computers are compatible with the RC2014. In fact, they all are uh, builds. So we can use this on our small computer central computers. And if you have an RC2014, it will work on that as well. So um, additional, additionally to this, we have a configuration directory. And this configuration directory allows us to do different builds because there are kind of more than one way to build a RC2014. Some of them use the ACIA adapter. Some of them use the SIO adapter. Um, in this case, uh, these .args files are used to build a little script for running emulators for each of these. Uh, now, I actually have my own port of this and I have submitted some changes upstream. They're very minor, but some of the changes that I've made, they don't really belong in a default Collapse OS. So you can see here I have my own branch 
And in here I've made some changes that are specific to Small Computer Central. Now one thing I've done is I've updated this sub-module Dusk OS to just add a new line when it boots. Whenever Collapse OS boots, it normally just says Collapse OS OK. But because I work in Minicom all the time and I kind of get junk on the line, uh, I want a new line before it prints Collapse OS. So I, I made a little change in Dusk OS that does that. And I'll show you how to make changes in the core.fs and in the RC2014.fs uh, so that you can make custom builds of, of your own Collapse OS. Um, in this video, I'll show you that. And also in the configuration, I'll show you how to make configuration changes so that you can make your own custom builds of Collapse OS as well. Typically, this is the only file you need to make is one of these. And um, once you have that, you can, you can just start building and, and working out from there. But if you want core functionality added or if you want some specific functionality added, you can uh, create this for specific things that target the RC2014 platform. Or of course you can go into Dusk OS itself and make some updates to the core.fs if you need some, some specific functionality to be uh, built directly into the OS. Now you'll want to take a look at the docs directory and this is actually not the best place to look for docs. There are some new documentations in here, but uh, these are all specific to the RC2014 port. If you want the full documentation, you want to go into the Dusk OS repository. So we're going to go over to Virgil's copy of it. We're going to go up here to the root directory of Dusk OS. And we're going to look in file system, doc, and then COS. Now, of course, if we go up one to this doc, these documents refer to Dusk OS mostly, but everything in the COS directory here, remember Dusk OS, FS, doc, COF, COS, my, my apologies. Uh, this is all specific to the Collapse OS operating system and not the Dusk OS operating system. So the, some of the most important files you're going to want to look at here to learn how to use Collapse OS are the intro, the usage, this one's very important, and um, the dictionary, this one's also very important. The dictionary contains all the list of words that are used to program the computer and uh, explains their usage. The usage file goes into a lot of details about how to actually implement things with those words. Uh, intro is pretty important for understanding the basics of, of how to operate uh, this particular language that, that Collapse OS is. It's a, it's a fourth based language, as I've mentioned. You're also probably going to want to look in this ASM directory and perhaps even this code directory. If we dig into ASM, this will teach you about how to use the, the built-in assembly language uh, that, that this operating system has. You want to look at intro and you want to look at Z80. Uh, this also has cross compilers for each of these other platforms. So if I wanted to build a version of Collapse OS that was capable of producing binaries for the 6502, I could do that. If I wanted to build something that could produce binaries for AVR chipsets, I could do that as well. So uh, this is actually a pretty robust little system. It's got a lot of cool stuff. And we're going to learn just a little bit about it today. Now, I am very far from an expert on this system. I'm certainly not an expert on the fourth programming language. And I may stumble through a little bit of this because I'm learning how to handle this system and I'm, I'm still pretty new to, to understanding it. I've been using it a long time, but I have been trying to penetrate the obtuse syntax of this language for some time. And it's, it's just not the most straightforward thing to learn. But hopefully, if you watch this, you'll be able to get past some of the blocks that have slowed me down and get started really quickly with Collapse OS. All right, let's get logged in to the system. Minicom. Let's turn the system on. 
All right, we have Small Computer Central. Now, I have here a system that I can send a hex file to. And I have a prepared revision of Collapse OS built. And I'm gonna show you how to install it on this system, how I install it on this system, and I'm gonna run it a little bit. But then we're gonna look at some paperwork to see exactly what's going on and how we can use this to actually do useful things. And then I'll show you some example code. Now I'm gonna to go to my revision because I have some uh, special things built in here. Now I'm using a loader. I have this loader.asm. And this is some code that I wrote that I adapted from RC2014's upstream repository that allows me to swap out the bottom 32K of ROM with 32K of RAM. So my system has more than 64 kilobytes of ROM and it has more than 64 kilobytes of RAM. But of course the Z80 can only address 64 kilobytes of contiguous address space. So the computer itself has this feature where it can page out ROM with RAM. So once I send a signal to the correct port, what will happen is the ROM will suddenly swap out with RAM and I will have a full 64 kilobytes of RAM. Now once I do that, if I don't have something running or ready to run, then the system will hang. So I have this bootloader and what it does is it copies itself and the entirety of Collapse OS from the ROM into a high location in, in RAM. And then it does that page. Now, since it's already running from RAM, it first of all, it moves itself and then it jumps to a location within itself in that new copy. And so it's running from high RAM. So all of a sudden, it's in high RAM, it does the page, the ROM is gone. There's now empty or otherwise garbage filled RAM where the ROM used to be. Now the bootloader's still running from memory and I'll show you this code shortly. And it will copy back all of Collapse OS just by itself to the lowest portion of RAM, which is now 0000, 000, 000 hex address, right? So then the bootloader will jump to zero, which starts Collapse OS. And you'll see that here shortly. Now I have a copy of the ROM without the bootloader, a copy of the ROM with the bootloader, and then I have a hexadecimal version of the copy with a bootloader. I didn't put with bootloader on it, but this has the bootloader. So I'm gonna send this hexadecimal version because as we've explored in previous videos, like and subscribe by the way, also check out my Patreon, check the description for links. Once we, because Small Computer Central, as we've explored, has a hex loader running, we can just send this as an, exe file, as an ASCII file and it will automatically load it into memory based on the hex location. And because I have the firmware card firmware developer module installed on this computer, what that does is it writes anything addressed to zero to a special place in memory <clears throat> that I can flip a switch and then access as though it's the lower 32K of ROM. So now that's loaded up, I can just flip this switch, hit reset, and now I'm in Collapse OS. Now that happened really fast and what you didn't see is of course all the bootloader stuff happening uh, because it's, it's written in hexadecimal. So let's take a look at that. Oops. All right, make that the full screen. And what you see here is the bootloader code. So we start at zero, we run a couple no ops, we load our destination, which is 8,000 hex, that's the 
bottom of the upper 32K of RAM. This is where RAM starts when the system is booted up. Everything before this is ROM and I won't be able to write anything there yet. This is our destination. This is our source. This is the amount of data we're gonna copy. And then we do this LDIR, it iterates over this set of data and, and performs uh, the, the load from one location in memory to another location in memory. And that moves everything into this location in RAM, including this entire bit of code, the binary representation of it. Then we jump to a location in memory that we happen to know is right here. We're actually jumping to this no op. After we've copied all of this, including itself into this location in memory, we know that when we jump to this location in memory, we're gonna land at this no op. And then we're gonna give ourselves another no op. And we, we happen to know that because no ops are a specific size. So we're gonna give ourselves another no op that just gives us a little time. And then we do the same thing. Now, I happen to know because I've compiled this code and checked the size that this is where Collapse OS starts when it's concatenated to the binary file that this code generates. And I'll show you that. If we look in here, if we look at the make file specifically, what you'll see is that I've added code here to create a, the loader ROM. So I can create the loader.bin from that code. And that creates a file called loader.bin. And then I create the ROM, the LROM, which is the ROM with the loader. And the way that I do that is I just cat, concatenate a file, the bin, to a new file name. And then I concatenate the old ROM to a new file name. And you can see up here I have these defined. ROM name is the original ROM that gets generated. LROM name is the revision of it with the loader. HROM name is the hex revision of this. And the way that I create the hex is I simply use the bin2hex.py, which comes with uh, Python 3 Intel hex tools. Um, yeah, and so this is a really simple thing. I don't even really build this correctly. I'm just compiling two and completely separate pieces of code and then concatenating them together and it, it just works. So that's a bit of a kludgy way to do it, but um, it, it works fine and it's how I do it. So that's how we get our full 64K of memory. So let's take a look at some memory models so we can actually understand a little bit more about what's going on here and then we can start doing some coding. So this is what the memory map of a default configuration of Collapse OS is going to look like. We have 32 kilobytes of EEPROM in the lower 32K. The upper 32K is going to be RAM. Here start starts at the first location in RAM. And in this case, because we have 32K filled with ROM, it has to start at its earliest at this 32K mark where the RAM begins. Fourth language uses a dictionary of words and the dictionary lives in ROM. But as you begin to define your own words, it adds to that dictionary. Here start is where the here variable is located. The concept of here is important to fourth. We're not gonna to get too deep into it, but we know that here is the end of the dictionary. It's the most recent word in the dictionary. It's the beginning of where, it's the beginning of where we place our own words. Now there's some system variables that live a little higher in RAM. These get placed in RAM as part of the initialization during boot up. These are the sysvars. And then we have something called a stack. The stack is actually two stacks, and one of them is the parameter stack, and one of them is the return stack, and they grow towards each other, and they can actually clash and interfere and cause problems. But 
If you're doing things well, you're not supposed to cause that to happen. Now, the default configuration starts us here and it gives us a 256 kilobyte or a 256 byte stack. Uh, but the configuration that we've installed on our system is configured a little differently. This is approximately 2000 hex, which is um, eight kilobytes uh, where we're starting. It's actually less than eight kilobytes. Now, Collapse OS fits in a, in a ROM less than eight kilobytes. So what we can do, and I'll show in the configuration, is we can set this so that um, we can set here start such that it starts at the earliest location in memory after we do the page. So once we page out, instead of having a hard separation here where ROM ends and RAM ends, we have a copy of Collapse OS living in RAM and we could actually write over that. It would cause problems, but we could write over that. Um, and our here is gonna start at the actual literal end of the most recent word in the dictionary. So we have more room to work with in RAM. And so what I've done also is I've given us a 124 bytes, a full kilobyte of this stack. And SysVars can change depending on your configuration. The more kind of drivers you install, uh, the more space SysVars is gonna take up. All right, let's go back to the code and I'll show you a little more about how to do some coding with this language. All right, so looking at the configuration, you can actually see that I drew my uh, memory map backwards a little bit. The parameter stack actually starts at the end of the uh, stack and it grows upwards and the return stack actually starts at the beginning of the stack and it grows downwards. So these two stacks grow towards each other and they take up the same kind of memory space. Um, if they hit each other, that's called an overflow and that'll cause problems, but uh, you're not supposed to cause overflows. If you're causing an overflow, you have a bug in your code, basically. You should be aware of how much space you're using and there are words that you can call to teach you about it. Now, uh, this configuration just pulls in, it sets up some variables, the sysvars, and it pulls in some uh, code that it needs in order to boot up and in order to use the serial interface, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this here is the driver for the compact flash card, which is new. This was just recently released and it's why I can make this video. Um, all right, so let's get back into the computer and reset it. We're in small computer monitor. Let's send a copy of our code. I need source. I need my revision. And oh, I need to rebuild it. I, I did a clean make. Go, swap over, reset, collapse OS, okay. All right, now, this is a subset of fourth. It's not an ANSI compliant fourth. It doesn't implement all the same words and it has some unique features that are specific to it. So if you are familiar with fourth, as many of you may be in my audience, um, it's going to be a little different than what you're used to. Now, in order to define our own words, we start with a colon and we end with a semicolon and we need spaces between everything. Every single word is delimited by a space. So um, we're going to blink some lights. <laughs> we're going to do some, some blinky lights. I'll show you what the lights look like when they're blinking. Uh, we want to do a uh, light race but in order to blink some lights, we know we already know that we don't want to blink them too fast. So we know that we need a pause feature. Now we don't have a sleep function, right? It says sleep word not found. So um, 
This is a reverse polis notation type stack. Anytime we place a number uh, onto the stack, we can see that it lives on the stack. This word allows us to examine the stack. You can see this five that we just placed here. If we wanted to add a one to that, we would then place a one on the stack. We can see the stack. This is the top of stack right now. It's a first in, last out stack. Now, if I wanted to plus these two together, I can just do plus, and that alters the stack. And you can see, and then I can pop that off of the stack and see, get the actual value and do stuff with the value, right? So we're not gonna get too deep into the details. Know that you can go into the um, Dusk OS, FS document COS and you can read all about these less usage. This explains some of the stuff I just explained, uh, how to actually interact with the stack. This is how you can write to and read from memory. Every one of these are examples of words. Well, now we want to define some of our own words. First of all, I know I need a sleep function. We have no sleep function. So there's a couple ways I can implement this. The easiest and quickest way is I'll make a, a, a word called ticks, meaning like ticks of the clock. Um, and I want this to do nothing. I want it to waste an amount of time in, I want it to just waste an individual uh, or a specific amount of ticks. So I want a for loop here. Now, what this is gonna do is it's gonna take whatever number is on the stack. If I put a two here, for example, and I did four, I'm putting a two on the stack and then four is gonna consume that two. And the for loop says, you know, do this loop for two times, for however many times. So this, we're defining a new word and we don't necessarily want it fixed. So we want for uh, a given amount of time to do no operations. And then next is how you end the for loop. And then we're doing this. To, uh, th we're, closing, we're closing the word. So we've just defined a word called ticks. Now, if I want it to tick one time, I can type one ticks, right? That just spent one cycle doing a no-op or however many cycles a no-op takes, which might be more than one. Um, so if I wanted a single tick, I can say, you know, tick one ticks. Now I have a thing that waits one exact cycle. If I wanted to wait longer, I can put some arbitrary number in here. I can increase it. There we go. You can see it pauses for an amount of time because it's just spinning its cycle doing no ops. Now that's, that's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is to use assembler. Instead of doing a colon and a semicolon to define the word, we can define the word using a code and a semicolon code to close it. So this time we want to do sleep. And since this is, oh, actually, we can't yet. We're about to get an error. In order to do this, first we have to load the assembler from the compact flashcard. Now the compact flashcard contains a file system that got built along the way. Uh, one more up. Uh, when I ran my make command, it created this directory called fs. Now fs is actually a symbolic link um, to dusk f, dusk os <coughs> subdirectory but you can go to fs, cos. The make file created this file called block. Block contains the entirety of um, collapse OS, including everything that we've included in our configuration file, plus a bunch of extra stuff that we didn't. No, less. You can see here, this is this is a collapse OS file system. This is a fourth 
block file system. And what I've done is I've used DD to place this on my um, to place this on my compact flashcard. Now I don't have the compact flashcard in here right now. Here we go. Here's an example. But when it was in here, it was at dev SDC. So I just did a straight copy of this block file system onto the compact flashcard, and that gave me a copy of the file system we were just examining in XXD. And now I can load it. Now I want to run the ATA uh, dollar sign command, and that will initialize the CF card. And now I can actually look at what's on it with the list. If I want to look at the, the very first block, which is an index of what's on it, I can see that. So you can see at 001, there's useful little words. At 0010, or at 010, there's, a, um, there's the block editor. Uh, so if I wanted to look at what the useful little words look like, I can list that out. These are all part of it. This is code. Now, if I want to load this code, I can do something like uh, zero, zero, 001, well, just one through. Actually, let's take a look at, at the list again. If I want to load this code, useful little words, which you're encouraged to load if you're doing things, uh, advanced things. Um, goes from one to nine. So if I wanted to load that, I could say one, nine, load range, enter. And then it loads that into the dictionary. Now the dictionary lives in memory. Oh, so it couldn't do it because I need to first load the Z80 assembler. Now, the Z80A word is a loader word. It runs the same kind of command I just ran. It, it says uh, from 100 to 109, from block 100 decimal to block 109 decimal, um, uh, do a load R. So now if I try to do a 19 load R again, it'll probably work. Well, it won't because it already I already messed it up by trying to do it once. Um, I'm going to reset the system. In any case, you can load blocks that way. Let's go ahead and do ATA at Z80A. That initializes the CF card and loads the assembler. We lost our ticks word, which is not my favorite word. So let's do a sleep. Instead of doing the colon, semicolon, we're going to do code sleep. And here we want to actually look into our documentation a little bit. ASM intro flow words. So these flow words are very similar to flow words that you'll find in native fourth but these are specific to the assembler and they have this little colon after them or comma after them. Um, all the assembler words have the, a, colon after, a comma after them. So in this case, I want, to, I want to waste a little time in assembly and the best way that I can do that is to just count down on something. So first I want to protect whatever's in my registers. And then I want to load up BC one set of registers with a number. And it needs to be an immediate number. And I'm loading it in there. So I just picked a large number. Uh, the assembler has a specific syntax because we are in a reverse Polish notation operating environment. So what we're doing is we're saying uh, load BC with FFFF and we're defining, we're letting the assembler know like, hey, this is a number. We're not loading a register into a register. We're loading a raw immediate number. So we need this little immediate flag so that it knows how to handle it. Um, and then we can 
uh, begin a loop. And we want to make sure we're using the correct form of begin because begin is also a word and it will begin a loop, but we're doing this in assembler. And then we can uh, decrement BC. And then we can load A with B. Now this is a way to compare the content. This is a way to check the contents of um, BC and check if it's zero while also wasting a little time, uh, which is what we want to do. So we are decrementing BC, we're loading A into B, and then we're oring A and C. Now, normally, you would just, in a normal compiler, you would load A, and then you would just say C or. You wouldn't have to put this, but because we're working with a stack that expects a couple, uh, a couple of entries in it, we would get an underflow if we did this without the A. So uh, you'll see that this particular assembler, if you're familiar with assembly, has some eccentricities. Now I want to hit enter or I'm going to run out of space. And when you run out of space, it'll automatically enter. Uh, we're still working on our loop though. So we've got BC, we've decremented it, we've checked if it's zero. If it's not, we want to go back. So we want to break and jump if not zero, jump relative not zero, which is also got a comma. And then we should be able to close the code word. All right, now if we type sleep, it does not work right. Okay, that was silly of me. I forgot to uh, do a closing EXX. So this is exactly the same code that you just saw me type, except after this jump relative, if not zero, I do an EXX to return the preserved registers to what they were. And then I end the code. And now when I run sleep, it waits a moment. So now I can build uh, a longer sleep out of, out of this. Uh, say I wanted to make sure I slept at least a second. Like that was less than a second. Uh, I could create a long sleep. And I could do four sleep next. Now you'll notice this is very similar to that, that ticks loop that we made earlier. But this is going to wait more than one single tick. So we're naming it something a little bit... <laughs> A little bit nicer so get, let's say we gave it a five long sleep you want that slept a lot longer so let's give it a ten long sleep that's a good amount of time we can we can flash our lights without things moving too fast um, one thing I want to show you is kind of how you could do variables so Say I wanted to say I wanted a, a a more convenient way than typing a number in long sleep. I could make a pause word, but I could use a variable so that I can alter the length of that pause words. Uh, so let's just give it an arbitrary value. Let's do thirteen hundred hex value uh, period. Right now, if I do period it puts 1300 hex on the stack. I can actually print it in hex if I do, there we go. And by deep, if you type this, it'll give you back a decimal. If you type this, it'll give you back the least significant bit. If you type this, it'll give you back a 16-bit uh, value in hex. So that's pretty cool. Uh, traditional fourths, you will use a hex word to switch between. Um, although min fourth is a pretty cool one that has uh, 
similar words like that. It's it's a decimal value or a hex value um, printout. So that's a little aside. <laughs> so now we have we have a, a variable and we want to make a new word called pause and it lasts for a period of that amount of time and it sleeps for that amount of time and actually that's going to be a huge number and if i if i uh oh long sleep long sleep we actually don't want to give it that high a number because it will sleep for a very very long time so because that's a bad number to give it we're going to change it already uh, this is how we alter the value of that variable and now we can do pause by itself and it will pause for a value of five you can probably sit down and do the math on the crystal and figure out well how many <laughs> how many of these periods do I need to wait in order to actually equal a second or a millisecond or something like that and you could tune your settings to where you actually have a, a predictable amount of time. Um, you could also maybe do something with real-time clocks because those are available, but uh, you could certainly do something with counter timer counter modules, but that is for future videos. So to begin with, we want to create some lights. Now we know that we have uh, an input output module that lives at port zero. And we can read and write to that port with, uh, read to and write from that port with the words PC, with the words PC write, or however you say it, and PC fetch. Um, if I wanna write a value to that port, I can do it like this. That turns on all the lights. If I wanted to turn them back off, I can do that. That turns them off. I have eight lights. They represent um, an eight bit value. So anything between zero and 255. So uh, what I want to do with this is do some bit shifting to create a cool little effect. So I want to do L race one, two, zero. PC at. Now what I'm doing here is I'm putting a one on the stack and then I'm duplicating it to keep track of a copy of it. And then I'm writing that duplicated copy out to port zero and that's going to put a one on the stack. Now I can begin a loop. I can loop seven times and you'll notice this is a for loop. This is not the way that you would normally do it in fourth. This is a, a word that is specific to collapse OS and dusk OS. Normally I think you would do something like seven zero do and then you would do your stuff and then you would type loop and it, it would come back around. But in this case we do seven four because we wanna we want to shift seven times and then we want to pause and then we're gonna bit shift that and then we might want to keep track of a copy of it and we want to PC up to zero and we want to finish the loop. Now when this loop is done, we're still going to have a copy of the number that we've been outputting. So we want to drop it so that we don't end up overflowing the stack. Now when I run L race, I get lights racing across the computer. L race. It's not much of a race, it's going pretty slow, but we can adjust that period variable to change it. And it stopped. Now I want to do a similar thing. R race. We want to start with 80 because we want the topmost light, 80 hex, which is uh, 128, I believe. And it's the same algorithm, except in reverse. R race. R race. Yay. 
Let's speed it up. That's much better. And you can see if we went with the ticks or if we went with a smaller number in our sleep word, we could go even faster. But this is good. This is what we'll use for our demonstrations. Now we can create a word uh, that does both of them. Um, first of all, let's turn, let's do a clear word. This is to turn off the lights. There we go. Now we can create a race that we can d define an amount of times that we want it to run. Race for uh, our race clear. There we go. We could even do it infinitely if we did a forever race. We could do begin one race again. And if we created that word and ran it, it would run forever. We'd have to reboot the computer. <laughs> so we're not going to create it. We're not going to run it. Um, but we can do even more with this. We can listen or input from this device. Uh, for example, let's do, all right. So we can do more with this. And here I've done a little bit more. I've created this word called key press. Now key press is gonna begin polling for an input at zero, at port zero. And when it gets an input other than zero, it will exit and leave that number in the stack, leave a copy of that number in the stack. And we can prove that by running key press and pressing one of the keys and then printing what we got. There's an 80, I pressed the, the uh, seventh bit. Uh, so that is the correct number. Um, if we examine the stack, we can see it's empty now. So, We've got our pause, we've got our race, we've got our um, key press. So now we can use all these words to build a little app. Poll. Uh, we can say key press race. And uh, there we go pole and when I press one it races one time and exits and when I press any other number it races that many times and exits and we can make this a forever app forever pole begin poll again. Now it runs forever. So if I press it once, it races one time. If I do two, it races two times. Four. Hypothetically, if I could press multiple buttons at the same exact time, I could get an exact number but uh, I'm probably not that quick. Yeah, so that's cool. And if I press this one, it'll do it 128 times. So that'll be a little while. <laughs> okay, so if you want to make changes to the core of 
Collapse OS, you can go into the Dusk OS repository, COS, and alter this core.fs. This is the operating system. Now we're not going to do that because I don't really want to break anything dramatic, but that's where you go to do that. Uh, if I want to make customizations to this particular port, I can alter this file here and you'll see I have added this little section sleep function. All right, this wasn't here before. So now I can, I've added this block here and this is my, my sleep. It's very simple. I make the modification. I run make. It gives me everything I need. If I reboot into small computer central, small computer monitor rather, I can send this new copy. Boot back into it. And there is my built-in sleep function. Uh, I could even add the race functions if I wanted to, uh, and they would be built in as well. So, yeah, uh, hopefully that helps. I know it's a little scatterbrained. Uh, I'm kind of all over the place learning this particular system. It's pretty obscure. Uh, when in doubt, check the documentation. It's really very helpful. And practice the assembly language because that really helps make the code readable. And once the code starts becoming readable, it starts becoming writable. And you're going to have a lot of fun learning it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Peace.